I want to ask you a question. When I say the word prophet, that is P-R-O-P-H-E-T, P-R, did I say it right? P-R-O-P-H-E-T. Well, I had the other prophet on my brain, apparently. If I say that word, what comes to your mind? Elijah, fiery character, Elijah, in the wilderness, Elijah sitting alone, waiting for the earthquake and the wind for God to appear in that way, this dramatic character. Or perhaps you think of a grisly old character in strange clothing marching up and down the street with a sign that says, Repent, for the end is near. What do you think of when I say the word prophet? I think sometimes when I imagine a prophet of this old man who used to be at the Wailing Wall, now called the Western Wall in Jerusalem, every day. We saw him twice on two different tours of the Holy Land. Walking up and down in strange clothing with a shofar, a ram's horn, in his hand and preaching. And every now and then he would punctuate his preaching by blowing on the ram's horn, the shofar, the trumpet blast signaling the coming of the Messiah. Perhaps you imagine a fortune teller when you hear the word prophet. A tarot card spread out on the table, crystal ball, reading palms, telling the future. Maybe that's, if you're, if you're of a certain age, perhaps you think of someone like Jean Dixon. Some of you remember Jean Dixon. She called herself a prophet. She claimed to be able to foretell the future. Or the amazing Criswell was another so-called prophet who could supposedly tell the future. Both of them became famous because they supposedly were foretold the JFK assassination. But they had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prophecies, most of which did not come true. But you get one right every now and then out of luck, and it makes your reputation. Gene Dixon also wrote a horoscope book for dogs uh, in addition to that. Maybe you think of those folks when you think of fortune tellers, uh, of of prophets. You think of fortune tellers, somebody that's going to tell the future. Even though they get it wrong most of the time, Jean Dixon said that World War III would break out in 1958. She said that cancer would be completely cured in 1967, that in the year 2000 there would be nothing but peace all over the world. The amazing Criswell said that Mae West would be elected president and that she would celebrate with her friends on the moon. A little strange, I think, as a prediction, but he didn't quite get it right. What do you think of when you think of a prophet? What I want to ask us to do this morning is to lay those things aside, those images we have, and to think about the word prophet or prophecy in a bigger context, in the larger biblical context, and the role of a prophet. And I want us to do it by listening to Moses as he responds to what's going on in the camp. Let me, tell, let me set that story up. It's, it's the wilderness. The people of God have been in slavery for 400 years. They've been set free now for a few weeks. God has fed them when they got hungry. God sent the manna, you remember, in the wilderness. Garrison Keillor says that manna is Hebrew for tuna casserole. And that someday we will discover all of the original Hebrews were, in fact, Lutherans, he says. In reality, the word manna means, what is it? Because when they saw this stuff, that's what they said. Manna, what what is it? And what it was, was the provision of God. God giving them food in the wilderness. And God gave them water when they were thirsty. And God protected them when enemies approached. And they knew all of this, but they were restless. And they began to complain. And they missed the food that they had back in Egypt. Even though they were slaves, they had predictable meals, more or less. They had meat to eat. They had spices. They had all sorts of vegetables. And so they complained and they wept about this manna that they had to eat. They got tired of it. And they said, according to the text, 
We had all of these meats. We had spices. We had cucumbers and onions and all of that to eat in Egypt. And now all we have is this manna to look at. Well, Moses started complaining too because they complained to Moses so much and he heard them crying and weeping and complaining so much that Moses started complaining to God. God, why have you done this to me? Why have you laid the burden of leadership of this people on me? Lord, I didn't conceive these people. I didn't give birth to these people. And now you want me to carry them around in the wilderness and suckle them like children, he said. Lord, what have I done to deserve this? If you really care for, care, care for me, you will just allow me to go ahead and die, he said. He's covered up with the burden of the leadership of these people. And there are even some of them wanting to go back to Egypt, back to slavery. Some people have called this the Back to Egypt Committee that they formed. Looking back rather than looking forward. But... But God intervened again. And God gave Moses the gift of delegation. He said, get together 70 elders and and go to the tent of meeting and meet with them there and my spirit will come upon you, upon all of them. And that's in fact what happens. The spirit comes upon Moses and God, it says, gives a measure of the spirit to all of those elders. But there are two that did not come out to the tent of meeting. They remained in the camp and they began to prophesy in the camp. And there is a young man, it says, who tattles on them. Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Aaron, who is Moses' longtime assistant, says, Master, make them stop. You know, I think they represent, Aaron and and this young man, represent a a group of people that we always have with us. Everything must be done just in a certain way. And it's not appropriate for them to prophesy outside of the tent of meeting, in other words, outside church, that they shouldn't be doing it over there. And, And perhaps a notion of a kind of hierarchy where where prophets, those who can, <clears throat> who really receive the Spirit, are up here someplace. And these two are just a couple of guys in the camp, and they really shouldn't be doing that. But Moses' response is, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets and had the Spirit of God upon them? If only... Moses is saying all of God's people were prophets and had the spirit of the Lord upon them. It's it's in that spirit, not the young man's or Aaron's, that Paul comes along later and, and, and speaks of the church. We're one body. There is neither slave nor free, Jew nor Greek, male nor female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. There is one spirit, and it is one spirit of which we all Partake, Paul says. One spirit of which we all partake. We live, we move, we have our being in God, in Christ. Paul says that we live by the Spirit, and if we live by the Spirit, we walk by the Spirit. So Paul speaks of the Spirit coming upon everyone and being a part of all the church. Moses says it this way, if only all of the Lord's people were prophets and the Spirit of God rested on all of them. So I got to thinking, what if we were all prophets? What if we were all prophets? What would that look like and what would that mean? I don't believe it means that we become fortune tellers. The prophets weren't that. They were future-oriented quite often. They came with words of warning sometimes about what would happen if the people did not change, if, if they continued to oppress the poor, or if they continued to marginalize those who were powerless, that sort of thing. If they continued to disobey God, this is going to be the result of that. So sometimes there is this future orientation. But there's also a word of hope, a message of hope in the midst of the situation. In other words... 
what a prophet does is brings the perspective of God into the current situation. That's what a prophet does. And so I wonder, what if, what if we were all prophets? What if we, in our lives, where we work and where we live and in our sphere of influence, as we go about our business, where we play with our families, in our community, our work, what if we brought the perspective of God into our current situation? What if we were all prophets in that broad sense of the word? What if it's true what Paul says and that a measure of God's Spirit is given to each one of us and that we can live in the Spirit and move in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit? What would that mean? Let me suggest that it would mean, for one thing, that we would speak the truth in love in whatever situation in which we found ourselves. And that we would speak the truth in love, especially to power. That's another classic way of talking about the prophets. They spoke the truth to power. They brought God's perspective to power. Now the reality is that all of us in this room, in one sphere or another, possess power. And the question is, how do we use it? It's true in every society. It has been from earliest time that the temptation for those in power is to use the power to make lives better for them make life better for themselves rather than for all it is a temptation it's a temptation for anybody when they gain power to use that power to make it better for themselves rather than for the whole common good and so people who are followers of Christ those who seek to bring the perspective of God into the current situation will always ask the question, how will this benefit everyone? How is it best for everybody? What is the thing here that will cause, will bring about the most just justice throughout the land, throughout the family, throughout the church, throughout the community, or whatever that sphere of influence is? If we are all prophets in that broadest sense of the word, we will bring that God perspective to our current situation. And here's another thing about that. It can be a lonely place to be. When we are the voice that is bringing the perspective of God into a certain situation, into the real specifics of where people live, we can be the voice crying in the wilderness to use the words spoken about John the Baptist. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. It can be a lonely place to be. A couple of weeks ago, Susan and I rented a classic movie, Twelve Angry Men. Many of you have seen it. It stars Henry Fonda, Lee J. Cobb is in it, other stars. And it's about a jury. And the movie begins, actually, with the end of the case. It's already been presented. The jury is being dismissed to go to the jury room begin their deliberations. They go into this hot room without air conditioning, and it seems clear from the beginning that just about everybody has already made up their mind. This this young man is guilty. He's charged with murder. His life, literally, is on the line in their decision of guilt or innocence. And they begin their deliberations. They take a vote a straw poll, and they discover there's one person who believes there is sufficient doubt to acquit the young man of this crime. It's the Henry Fonda character. One voice holding out, one voice wanting to take the time to deliberate, and he begins to present his reasons for thinking there is reasonable doubt And in that presentation, he asks questions, he presents information that challenges their prejudices, challenges their need to get this over with, the busyness of their lives that doesn't have time to take seriously the life of a young man whose life is on the line. 
In the course of the conversation, people are angry, and they're angry at him, and they begin to be angry at each other because he's raising difficult and tough questions. He's bringing a perspective into that current situation that makes them very uncomfortable. As the movie progresses, one by one, they begin to change their votes. And at the end, the young man is acquitted. And it seems evident why he was acquitted. And it leaves you with a haunting feeling, or it did me, this haunting notion. One voice made the difference between life and death for the young man. One voice refusing to be bullied, but standing firm, bringing that perspective into that situation, made all the difference in the world. I think, I think in the best sense of the word, that's what we mean when we talk about prophecy or being a prophet. If only all the Lord's people were prophets, Moses said, and the Spirit of the Lord rested on all of them. You know, it's not just speaking words, this idea of bringing the perspective of God into a situation. It's also actions. In fact, we see in the prophets that they sometimes did not speak, but they acted out something. In some way, they, they had a, a, an action called a sign act that represented God's viewpoint or God's perspective in the situation with their action. And that can be very, very powerful. Dan Wakefield, a journalist, tells the story of how he became involved in the church for the first time in his adult life. He had stayed away from church. He was in a bar on Christmas Eve. And someone suggested, why don't we go to a candlelight service at a church nearby? And so they went to King's Chapel and attended the candlelight service. And his life was changed forever at that service. He enjoyed the people that he met there. He admired people that he got to know in the church. He became involved in some of the activities of, of the church and ended up going on a retreat for a weekend. And on that retreat, he said there was a man who was obviously very troubled. He said he, he just emanated uh, this trouble that he had in his life, that he was struggling with this terrible family issue that involved a divorce. And he just emanated that. He said, because of that, mostly unconsciously, he said, I stayed away from him. I kept my distance. And Dan Wakefield said, others did the same. And he noticed near the end of the retreat that he was standing by himself. And as he watched him standing by himself, another retreatant went to him and said, I'm so glad you came on the retreat. It was great to get to know you some and I'm glad that you're here. And Dan Wakefield said, I have to admit, I thought to myself when he said that, are you serious? Really? This guy's a downer. Who wants to be around him? How could you be glad he was here? And then the man went on and said, you know, I'd like to have lunch with you if you have the time when we get back to the city. And again, Wakefield said, I thought to myself, why would you want to do that? The guy will just bring you down. But he said as he watched, when that invitation to lunch was extended, he saw a look come across that man's face that said, I'm accepted. Somebody cares about me. He said just that simple action communicated so much. You know what was going on there? What was going on there is something Wakefield would have never labeled this way, but I'm going to label it that way. It was... It was a prophetic act. It was this action that brought God's perspective into that situation and not only communicated to the man who so much needed that message of the love and the acceptance and grace of God, but also communicated to Dan Wakefield and anybody else who happened to be watching that this is what God would have to happen in this situation. Would that all the Lord's people would be prophets. And the Spirit of the Lord would rest upon all of them. One of the things, it's an ancient practice that we say in baptism is, well, we lay on hands. 
the person who's baptized after the baptism, anybody who's gathered around there, you've seen it many times probably. And I invite everyone to lay hands on the child or the adult that's being baptized or when we confirmed our young people. And we speak of the Spirit. That in that ancient symbol, we become conduits of the Spirit of God. We communicate with that sign, that action, that the Spirit of God rests upon that person. And, and we say that they're born of water and the Spirit. And, and that they will be faithful disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because they have a measure of the Spirit. The Spirit of God, the breath of God, breathes life into us, into our faith community. And what if we were all prophets, bringing God's perspective into every situation of our lives? I want to invite you, with that in mind, to turn to page number 481 in your hymnal. Page number 481. This is a well-known prayer, but I invite you as we read it together, I invite you to make it your prayer. Not just words on the page or words that you read, but your prayer this morning. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen.